Chocolates. All right, awesome. Thank you guys for joining tonight. As you guys already know, we have another live Cash Flow Empire Tuesday call. And today we have a special guest, Lenny, who we've known for some time from the beginning of our journey, actually, Willie, Willie's and I, uh, till now. And we're excited to have this guy on, on the call. So a little bit about Lenny. We'll kick it over to you. Uh, tonight we have Willie and myself hosting the call, but Lenny, he's one of the co-founders and managing partners of uh, Great Dane Capital. Uh, if, you, if you've if ever met Lenny or talked to Lenny, Chad is always on his side. Uh, so tonight we just have we just have Lenny here, but uh, he's also served on a number of different boards of, uh, a number of different boards, right? Um, he served as the president of the boards of directors for the History Center for Orlando, uh, also for one of his fraternities, Lambda Chi Alpha, and and much much more. But uh, I'll kick it over to to Lenny to introduce himself, talk a little bit about his journey and how he got to to this point here. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you all for having me. I'm pretty humbled uh, to be here. Uh, I come from a corporate background. I think if you check out me um, on any social media, whether that's LinkedIn or Instagram, you'll find that um, I worked as a corporate executive uh, starting in sales and marketing for the Pillsbury company, uh, ended up going into brand management at their headquarters in Minneapolis. So I've lived all over the country with my career. Uh, after I spent 10 years at Pillsbury, I was recruited away by Johnson & Johnson and they offered to move me down to Jacksonville, Florida. And I was there for a couple of years working on their contact lens uh, brand, which is AccuView. So if any of you wear contact lenses, you probably know that brand. Um, and I worked on that brand with Walmart, Costco, Target, and all the major eyeglass companies. So if you go into a Walmart optometrist or a Costco optometrist and you see the display case with contact lenses in it, that was my project. I basically sold to Costco, you know, uh, that program and why it would help them in sales and it's made them millions of dollars. And then from there, I was basically stolen away by the Heinz company uh, to be based out of uh, Central Florida, calling on the major supermarkets within the Southeast, and that included Publix, for any of you that uh, know that store chain, and Winn-Dixie. So um, had a really good career start starting there, uh, but then I was asked to do an international business development gig in India. Um, and made them a million dollars in my first quarter. So they asked me to do it for all of the emerging markets, which ended up being uh, Asia Pacific, Middle East Africa, Eastern Europe, and uh, Latin America. So went to 53 countries within the, a five-year period. Um, got to see a lot of stuff around the world. Uh, so I, I, I know that uh, many of you have seen me travel quite a bit domestically since I've started with MFM and multifamily real estate. Uh, but yeah, I was hauling the the miles for quite some time. Uh, but uh, after uh, international business development, I uh, ended up uh, being asked to do the global systems implementation. Uh, so taking the 23 operating systems across the globe and it, uh, merging them all into one. And then my last role with Heinz uh, before they got bought by Berkshire Hathaway was Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer. So uh, very, very different um, background in terms of what I did in the corporate world, um, which a lot of that applies to what I have carried over into multifamily and real estate. So glad to be here. Awesome, awesome. So, Lenny, what made you transition from the corporate world to the um, multifamily world? Uh, well, I mean, I loved. So, first of all, I did love what I did uh, globally. Um, I loved, you know, 
my executive DNA is helping other people. And, uh, you know, sometimes like for J and J, they're a little bit more cutthroat, uh, because they're considered a pharmaceutical company. Um, so the financial, uh, companies, uh, banks, uh, the oil companies and pharmaceutical companies are notoriously very cutthroat in their, uh, you know, in their, uh, corporate culture. And it was a little bit different for the food companies that I work for, Pillsbury and uh, Heinz. It was more work-life balance, uh, emphasis on uh, family. And so that fit me better. And even when they evaluated my executive DNA, they were able to realize that for the DEI, so for the chief diversity and inclusion uh, position, that it still fit helping people. Um, and within multifamily, I'm not just doing this for the money. I think that the money is a tool for us to give back to the communities that we're buying these properties in. So our uh, our three values are growth, diversity, and community. Um, and so that was really important in terms of what we wanna do um, with the apartment complexes. So we, don't mind looking at uh, opportunity housing, affordable uh, opportunity zones, affordable housing, um, anything that helps the communities. Uh, we're we're big on that. We want to make sure that we become, um, you know, a, a center of hope for the the metros that we buy our apartment complexes. In. Well, that's very interesting. So not only did you bring over your skills over to multifamily, but also your mission statement and, yeah. and what you stand behind. So let me ask you this because complimented you on your jersey, uh, on your shirt, I'm sorry. We see the logo there. Can you tell us about Great Dane Capital, how, you, how the name came about and and uh, that, that entire story there? Absolutely. Uh, so we... Uh, rescue Great Danes. So we've had 11. So it we had nine. Um, well, actually, we had five at the most at a time. But, you know, previous to the most recent two, uh, we had up to nine. Uh, they're all rescues. Uh, it's part of our why. We currently have two. We had one for a while. And then this past Friday, uh, we picked up another one. Some Someone um, wanted to give us another one. She had been going through a divorce and she wasn't, uh, she wasn't in a position to uh, uh, take care of him anymore. And so she went to one of the sites and, and uh, basically I found this pup and he's been awesome. He, he fits right in. Um, he's doing awesome. And why Great Dane Capital? A couple reasons. Uh, one, uh, it, it is a way for people to be curious as I'm like, okay, why Great Dane Capital? Um, so they'll typically ask us. And it's usually, do you have Great Danes? And of course, we're off to the races with that conversation. Um, but even like with investors or anybody that we want to team with, anybody that loves dogs are kind of our kind of people. Right. And and so we have a lot of investors that love dogs and love that we rescue Great Danes. And then the other reason why we chose Great Dane Capital um, in multifamily, uh, you're kind of tasked with think bigger and you can't think much bigger than a Great Dane when it comes to dogs. And so that that ended up being a, a really good tagline for us. So it, it's actually on our logo thinking bigger because we yeah we couldn't do think bigger because it was already taken by the mentorship program that we're in yes let's talk about that how did you start getting into multifamily investing yeah so it was it was very interesting because uh we were going to buy some land and i think chad said it's 50 acres on the big island of hawaii uh, which had two homes on it. One was a, you know, a, a, a major 
uh, regular home. And then the other one was more like an in-law uh, home or apartment, but it had a uh, entertainment venue on the top floor and it had a lanai all the way around. And so we were thinking we could make this a all-in-one inclusive honeymoon wedding venue um, where you could have the wedding in Hawaii, the reception right there, and oh, you're already on your vacation because you're in Hawaii on the big island. And uh, we would use local talent. We would use, um, you know, uh, the food, the the Polynesian dancers, et cetera. Um, so uh, we ended up taking a look at that. We were going to also take a look at an apartment complex in Honolulu because the one on the big island with the 50 acres was pretty remote. And uh, I'm a more social urban kind of guy. So I wanted to make sure that we have access to um, that. And so, you know, it's really easy to fly in between the islands in Hawaii. Um, so we wanted to do, Chad really did his research. We wanted to do the ultimate house hack and basically get an apartment complex. And it ended up being about 10, to 14 units. Um, and if we had a full apartment complex, we could leave one for us anytime we wanted to come over to Honolulu or Waikiki. So as soon as we started taking a look at that, Tyler Devereaux started showing up in his uh, Facebook and Instagram feed. And he asked if I wanted to check it out. And I said, sure. We ended up checking it out. Um, Tyler ended up teaching our class as he did for most of them in the beginning. And uh, we were the first to sign up at our three day. And uh, we did that here in Northern California, but I'm typically based in Orlando, uh, just for anybody's reference that doesn't know. And so that's how, how we got into it. And how has this mentorship program impacted your life? And why is it important to invest in yourself? Uh, so two parts of the question. Uh, the first one is we've met some amazing people and several of them are on this call. You know, Chad's objective in doing this is to find friends that we want to do business with. And we've found like some of the best people that we know through this network um, and through this business. And it's it's very cool to see um, those relationships develop. Uh, you know, I've had a lot of friends within, you know, my college experience and through my corporate career. Um, Chad hasn't had that depth of friendship with too many people, and he's become very good friends with many of the folks uh, within MFM and within multifamily. So we've met some incredible people. And then I'm blanking on the second part of the question, Lily. Why is it important to invest in yourself? Ah, uh, uh, investing in yourself, very key to moving forward, especially if you want to be successful within real estate investing or just in life. I mean, uh, the mindset that you can get from any, and it doesn't have to be from MFM. There's a bunch of mindset programs out there or coaching or mentoring um, or accountability groups. Um, it it It's really big. Like I mentioned that our first or one of our values is growth. And it it's not just the growth of your investment portfolio. It is actually the growth personally, right? So None of us are ever going to be perfect, but it's you always want to strive to be a better person than you were the day before. And if if you're able to do that every day, somehow, whether it's uh, doing something, eating better, uh, working out uh, a little bit longer or, or harder, reading a book, um, or just helping somebody um, out on the street that you come across that you have no idea who that person is. Because I find that the character of who you are when nobody else is looking is a better indicator than uh, anything that you may say about yourself. It's all in the action. 
So you've gone from the idea of house hacking, you know, 10, 14 unit to having 75 million, you know, dollars worth of assets under management in that journey, right? Getting to, to the point where you are now, what has been the biggest piece of advice or kind of learning lesson that you picked up that kind of helped you either get to where you need to get to where you need to be right now or like where you are right now, or at least propelled you in, in that journey. Okay. So there, there are several things that I can share with that. So I'll try and highlight or uh, make it as quick as I can for each of them. Uh, the first being you need to be resilient and consistent because this is not an easy business. You know, if anybody that comes into multifamily signs up for anybody's mentorship program, whether that's MFM or any of the others, they are going to find that um, you're going to need to grind. You're going to need to hustle. You're going to have to work and it still may not work. You know, if, if any of you know our story, it is very much a big, um, it's a, been a big journey and it is very much uh, a, a tough one right? Life is going to throw you a bunch of obstacles um, personally, right? And the business is going to be tough and throw you a bunch of obstacles. So Chad and I have worked on over a dozen deals, like seriously on, on over and, and been involved in that many deals. But, um, you know, uh, we've only closed on the one. Now that one paid off in spades because it's 327 units, uh, but it took us a long time to close that one. And so a lot of people would have already given up or quit. And we see that a lot. I mean, Willie, Eddie, um, you and the three of us have been around for a while. Domingo's been it, in it quite a quite a long time. You have a couple of people, you know, you've seen people come in hot and then they fizzle away and you just don't hear from them again. And, and so that's one of the biggest things you have to do. And I apologize if you can hear my great Dane in the background, we have a guest. Um, so uh, I, I see a question from Alicia. Uh, how long have I been in multifamily? Uh, it's almost two years. Uh, today is uh, day 639. Um, so I journal it uh, every day. And so day. That's, yeah, definitely. I mean, it was one of the things that I was asked to do. Um, so it is... Uh, you know, I I think that to be able to track your journey, refer back to when this happened, when you submitted your first LOI, when you got rejected, when you got kicked off a team, all of that is uh, an important uh, part of your journey. And so, um, you know, if I'm ever to write a book, whether that's an ebook or an actual published book, um, you know, I, I want to have my days and numbers correct and so that's uh you know um that's what i want to make sure that i capture in my journal and i missed that question that just popped up how many deals have i done before we closed did i did yes. i see that yep. yeah over a dozen over a dozen so we got on the one deal that we were on for san antonio in february of 2023 um, and as soon as we technically qualified for that particular property, we didn't have to work on it anymore. We ended up doing a little bit more than we needed to, um, but we moved on to other deals and taking a look at stuff and started submitting LOIs. And what was very interesting is we had several colleagues bring us their deals um, because it was much bigger than they could handle uh, capital wise and in terms of the network of sponsors that could handle any gigantic um, deals. There are not a lot, like even Tyler couldn't do the deal that we were doing in Tulsa, right? I'm like, how did he close this property, the 616 unit property in Dallas that Willie and I um, walked the property with him? And we found out he, he co-sponsored with a, a couple other folks. And I'm like, oh, Okay, so that that's how that works, um, because you have to find sponsors that are liquid. And to be honest, uh, for any of you, um, 
you want as few sponsors on the deal as possible because otherwise they take huge chunks, right? Of the of the GP, right? So if you have to have two or three co-sponsors on that, that leaves leaves very little for the people that are not sponsors that weren't the um, uh, person that found the uh, property. So, um, you know, if you know somebody within the network that, or not, not just any sponsor that can handle a $75 million deal, you want to be able to interface with them. Um, and you, you honestly need a couple. You can't just have one because that person may not be liquid when you need them to be. And that's an important facet of being sponsored. And um, I know for your the San Antonio deal, right? You had a couple obstacles that you guys went through, right? I know um, you said that um, your lender backed out. Can you talk a little bit about that? It actually wasn't the lender. It was one of our major partners, which was JP Morgan. And so in June or end of June or beginning of July, uh, they were trying to buy First Republic. I'm pretty sure that I, there were a couple of banks that were going out of business right around then. And so they had to back out of this. Uh, the good, great thing was we did have um, three family offices as backup uh, to fill in where they pulled out. Um, the challenge with the property, and hence the reason why it took so long, was it was an opportunity zone, which is uh, moderated by HUD. And so when we had to switch out partners, the process started all over with HUD, which usually takes four to six months. And to be honest, we weren't sure it was going to close in 2023 because, you know, we were in the middle of December and had not heard word yet. And, you know, we found out on the Friday before uh, Christmas, it couldn't have been timed any more perfectly. We found out that Friday close to the end of the day that we had closed on that property. So that was pretty exciting. It was a good Christmas present. I was just about to say that great Christmas present. Yeah. <laughs> and that that's awesome. Like, you know, as far as the, the number of units, the, just the journey to close, I feel like a lot of people would have kind of went a little smaller, but you went all in, you went to uh, a specific deal opportunity zone with a lot of different obstacles and moving pieces right and knocked it out on your first you know as your first deal can you talk a little bit more about like any other obstacles um you know that you encountered that you know i, I can hear the uh the mindset and the resilience in in your responses in your voice can you kind of talk a little bit more about certain obstacles and how you kind of overcame those yeah so there were quite a few personal uh, obstacles that we ran into that had nothing to do with the business, right? And everybody does run into that. Uh, life gives you every reason not to do this, whether that's your other job or your family or your parents um, that you may need to take care of, or you had to go into the hospital and we actually... Um, know of a, a good friend in the Dallas area, he had to have his kidney, um, uh, a kidney transplant. So there's a lot of stuff that all of us are going to run into and you never know who's going through what unless they share, right? And so for us, it was, a, we were getting bombarded with uh, obstacles during the week before our, what we call our fast track in MFM. And so if you have not heard the story, basically, uh, we were in Florida. We found out his mom had a stroke where she couldn't speak or swallow. Um, the doctors wanted to intubate her. And we knew that was not something that uh, she would have wanted. Uh, it was basically in her papers, uh, DNR, D DNI, um, and, and so we needed to fly back and have that consultation with the doctor. Well, that was right when Hurricane Ian was coming to Florida. And so we needed to really get back to Northern California, which is where she was, um, have that conversation with the doctor before he had any surgery or did anything like uh, of the sort. 
Um, and luckily we were able to get back, um, you know, basically the customer service at Southwest Airlines was incredible. I, sp I was on the pho phone on hold for 90 minutes, uh, you know, just trying to get back because they had not issued a warning where you could change your flight because the hurricane was coming. Um, so we were able to get back on Monday. Um, we went directly to the hospital the next morning, first thing. Um, she was uh, still in a coma, right? And so, uh, you know, we had to put her in hospice. What was interesting is while we were there, she woke up and recognized Chad, smiled, and we were able to spend two hours with her. And it didn't change the fact that she needed to go into hospice. Um, and so we did that. And on the way home, you know, like as if things weren't already tough that week, we got in a big car accident. We were basically rear-ended at 70 miles an hour by somebody that wasn't paying attention. We were in stop traffic. And the only reason she wasn't paying attention, the only reason why she or her car stopped is because ours was in front of it. She didn't apply her brakes. She was not paying attention. Um, so we were both uh, sent to the ER in ambulances. And, uh, you know, it was, you know, a rough, rough, you know, I was not braced. Um, so I was not as, you know, uh, tensed up as Chad was, because he saw it coming. He's like, we're about to get hit. And by that time that registered uh, in my head, we had already been hit. It shattered all the glass in the entire uh, van, all the way up to the front, except for the windshield, which is tempered, right? So that's not gonna, that's not gonna split, but all, all of that glass came in into us, down our backs. Uh, it was pretty, pretty terrible. And Chad, you know, because he was tensed up, you know, he has injuries to his, his shoulder, his hip, his knee, his ankle. Um, and I, you know, I had whiplash that lasted two, three weeks. Um, and there's a, a little bit of long-term minor stuff, but nothing like what Chad has gone through. So, and that was the, the Tuesday before our fast track, which started Friday. And then on Friday, we went to our fast track after it was done at six, we went to dinner and then spent a couple hours with his mom in hospice, went to the next, uh, uh, day at the fast track, um, went through that entire day, um, went to dinner, went to, uh, the hospital to spend more time with her. Uh, and she passed away that evening. So it was, uh, it was kind of like she waited so it wouldn't interfere with what we were trying to do because the last time he had talked to her, he had told her what we were doing and she was for the first time in his life, proud of what he was doing. And so that was a pretty key moment. And the fact that she didn't pass away till after our fast track, um, it, it seemed a little bit eerily, um, you know, that she waited. And so that, everybody's going to run into something like that within their lifetime. Um, if not a couple of these obstacles. So, you know, being able to bounce back from that is, is key. Um, leaning on your network of friends uh, within multifamily or just that you've met doing this, it, it's uh, you know, it was pretty impactful for us. The people that we had just met at our, three day um were the only ones at the fast track so it was a handful of eight people that knew that we were in this major accident everybody else in the fast track class had no idea what had happened so um you know but they were incredibly supportive um you know they were 45 minutes away from us and were offering to give us a ride home because we didn't have a ride home the car is total right so um, but you know, this network and the people that we've met, um, is, has been incredible. And so I, I think Eddie, you had mentioned earlier that, 
uh, you know, what kind of advice or some of the tips that um, I'd like to share. Uh, one is that you, you know, if you're an introvert, you have to come out of your shell and meet people. So however you need to do that, whether it's practice with your closest friends, uh, practice in front of a mirror, read books, um, you know, go to motivational, um, you know, conferences or whatever. Uh, you have to be able to talk with people because this is a business of building relationships, right? And and so if you're not able to talk to people, you are really going to struggle with this business. Um, and then the social media part, which many people, including myself, don't really love it, uh, is also one of the major things that I've been coached to do, or Chad and I both been coached to do in order to get ahead, is get known on social media because everyone um, should know what you're doing. Otherwise, they're like, what do you mean Willie is buying an apartment complex? That's not what he does. Or what is Domingo doing? Doesn't he sell ice cream or isn't he uh, you know, part of an ice cream company? That, why is he buying apartment complexes or storage units or whatever? Um, they need to know what you're doing. And if you're not letting anybody know on your social media what you're doing, then you'll have a couple side eyes. It's like, what do you mean you want like me to invest in your company or your deal? That that is not what I know you as. And um, you know, especially if you're in a business uh for your W2 that is completely unrelated to real estate. So if you're um, you know, a, a realtor or a lender that deals with commercial or multifamily, most people don't know that you're you this is what you do and you have to let them know. So those are a couple of the tips that I have. Well, powerful, powerful story. And thank you for sharing. Like, yeah, so, no problem. Question, right? What for the viewer, what is the best best um strategies to raise capital? So I know you're a great capital raiser, right? So uh yeah, so I'll share this with everybody. Um one, you need to put yourself in places where you have a higher likelihood of running into accredited investors or higher network individuals. And you're not necessarily going to do it on a networking call that happens to be a bunch of other students that are also trying to do this. That's not where you're going to meet them. I, I, I love um, some of the conferences that I've been to, but it's, it's more a real estate thing and everybody is really trying to do the same thing. So if you're trying to find investors, that's not where you're going to find them. You need to go to conferences where the profession, whether that's lawyers, doctors, engineers go, and they're not sure. Oh, tech is another great one. Um, they're not sure how to invest their money, whether that's stock, crypto, real estate. That's Those are the people that you need to target. Um so if you happen to go to conferences or that happens to be coming to your city, those are always good options. Um, and then locations in general. general. If, if you play golf, you need to go to the country club because almost everybody there is going to be accredited. If they play golf and can afford to play golf at the nicest country club, you are going to run into millionaires there, right? Same thing for charity events or nonprofit events, fundraisers. You know, the people that go to those, I'm like, they're giving their money away, right? Go to those, right? Those are like, we, I took Chad to a United Arts uh, kickoff campaign. We ran into a bunch of investors there. So if you're able to do that, and, and actually, you know, that's, that's the artsy side. If you go to sporting events, professional, like basketball, like an NBA game, a, 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 a NFL or MLB box game. Um, those are all places where people are paying a couple hundred for tickets and they're not usually there by themselves, right? So those are high uh, likelihood spots that you can. The other one is airport lounges, right? So 
if you're flying with anybody in particular and they have a Delta Lounge or an American or United Lounge, that is key for you to, like many of those travelers are accredited investors. Hope that helps. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. And to ask a little bit more about your knowledge and your skills and capital raising, right? For everyone on the call that wants to start their capital raising journey, what other little nuggets or kind of advice can you share for someone that like they say, hey, this is what I want to do, but I just don't know how or where to start? Yeah, no problem. Uh, so I don't, I, I always... Um, I'm happy to share this and it, it's really important because a lot of us, you know, one of the exercises from our intro three-day workshop was to, hey, call somebody over the lunch break and see if they'll invest in your deal. And I, I frankly turned to Chad, I'm like, I'm not effing doing this. I'm not calling somebody out of the blue and say, hey, you want to invest a hundred grand in, you know, multifamily real estate? They're like, uh, you haven't called or we haven't talked for a year, two, three, or even six months. Um, yeah, how are you? You know, it, 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 it's such an awkward conversation. And so I ran through this. I saw Eric uh, 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 pop in on the, in the chat real quick. I, I actually um, went to his capital raising uh, webinar several months back. And um, I said, Eric, you need to get to know people first. Don't jump right into the business right away. You got to know, you have to know about Willie's uh, daughters or, you know, what Domingo does for a living or what Eddie likes to do in their life outside of multifamily. Um, it's, it's really important. And you know, if you're trying to make friends and make some deep connections with these, you you gotta you gotta get to know them. It's it's that rapport, like Alicia says. It's it's a rapport that you have to build. And you know, many of the investors that I have met since I've started this, you know, are are super high net worth individuals and. I'll, I'll share a story with regard to a billionaire um, that I was able to meet. And he's an awesome guy. He aligned in values in terms of what he wanted to do within his investing practice. And it was, he wanted to invest with impact, which is, and give back to the communities, et cetera. It was very, it was a very great conversation to have with him but I think what made a huge difference with him is I treated his wife, um, who's beautiful, and I think many people would treat her like a trophy wife. I treated her with respect and engaged her and made her part of the conversation and found out what was important to her or them together. And I think that made a huge difference um, in how he perceived me, because it wasn't like I was just trying to take advantage of, of him and his wife didn't matter. Um, people's families matter to almost everybody. So if you know nothing about their family, you need to find out. Um, you got to find out what people do for fun. You got to know where they want to travel or what, what, what bothers them in life. What, what is, what is holding them back from, you know, their dreams. Anything that you can refer to back in the next conversation you have with them without like jumping into the deal that you want them to wire money for. I never begin uh, even a business call like that. I would ask any single one of you on here, hey, how was your holiday weekend? What'd you do? Did you do it with family? You know, did you go to the beach? Whatever that is. Um, I actually had somebody, I had a Zoom call with somebody today, and the first thing she wanted to do is tell me about, you know, you know, what she wanted to do with multifamily. I'm like, so how was your weekend? And what'd you do? And, you know, she was taking a little back. I'm like, you know, 
if this is going to be a transactional, you know, conversation, I'm not going to do business with you. You know, I, I need to know who you are and I need to know, like, and trust you. And you're not going to get that by jumping into the business. And so I went through an exercise with Eric's webinar and I just said, Hey, tell me something about you that none of us know. And a lot of great stuff came out and, you know, it's something that you technically, if you're, especially if you're making notes can go back to. So if you're making or having a conversation with a high net worth individual, you need to know, you need to know what's important to them. Hey, JD. Hey, how's it going, Lenny? Good to, good to see you on. Thanks for joining. That is such heartfelt advice. Thank you for sharing. If anyone has any questions, feel free to raise your hands or just drop the questions in, in the comments here. Um, but, you know, kind of follow up question, right? So building the report, building the relationship, ma making sure that people understand that this isn't just a transaction or that you're just not in it for their money. How has that kind of taken you like where you are? Where has that kind of placed you having that mentality? So I, I think the building of relationships, I, I, I mentioned it on a previous podcast. Um, if you have a connection with somebody, they're more likely to invest with you, even if your deal is just okay. So if you have a B minus deal that, you know, somebody off the street would, wouldn't necessarily invest in, but they like you or they like your team, they are more likely to invest with that person than with somebody that is a complete jerk, even if that deal is phenomenal, right? So you got to, you got to make sure that you foster those relationships. It's, it's the one thing that will set you apart from everybody else that is doing this. And so I've learned that before I did multifamily because working on the boards that I work with, um, Eddie, you had mentioned that in my intro, um, I have a lot of connections with higher net worth individuals that I, I want to donate to the nonprofit that I work with. And there is no way that you can just call them up and say, hey, can you donate you know, a hundred grand to our, you know, our, our, our fund or to our foundation or to this cause, they're, they're not going to do it. If you start with, Hey, um, how have you been? I saw that your wife was in the hospital. Is she doing okay? Um, uh, or I saw that your son graduated or that your daughter's having a baby. And so congrats on being, a you know, a future or a grandparent. So all of those little conversations, it all matters. You know, don't, do not just call somebody or text somebody and say you want to talk to them about a deal. My, hot, my strong recommendation to you is reach out to two or three of the people. I know this is for everybody. Reach out to the two or three people and just say, hey, um, I, I wanted to reach out. I, it, it was Memorial Day weekend. I wanted to see, you know, did you, you know, what'd you do? It's been a while. Well, let's catch up. Then like a day or two later or later on the week after you've been um, actually having this text conversation with this person, then you can like, Hey, you know, I, we had talked a while back about, you know, this is what I do. Would you be in, interested in, you know, setting up a call to to kind of go over that. Then it's not out of the blue. You've just talked to this person, right? That week. Um, so do it during any holiday. Um, just reach out to a couple of folks. If you see something with somebody that you're connected with on social media and you see a big event that happened in their life, just reach out and congratulate them or say sorry for your loss or whatever. And just that. And then, you know, two weeks later, you can have another conversation with them. So it's not out of the blue. I, I, I always um, 
found it very interesting when anybody would text me and the first thing they do is, hey, can I borrow money or can you help me with this? And I'm like, okay, you only texting me because you need something from me and you never want to be that person. It, it's, it's, they will stop answering your texts or your calls. That's, that's just my feeling. Um, you know, I, 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 I know that's not, there are exceptions to every rule. Um, but I would rather err on the likelihood of, uh, solid relationship with somebody versus you know playing the numbers game and asking a hundred people if they want to invest a hundred grand in this apartment complex that I'm buying. I would rather do that because you'll burn bridges if you're spamming them with those kind of texts and they consider it spam. Guaranteed. Thank you, Lenny, for sharing these gems. Now some fires in the chat for my boy Lenny. Thank you. So, so um we got eight minutes left, Lenny. Um running um out of time. So I want to ask you one last question. What's next for you? For everything that um all the obstacles um you overcame and all the success, right? What is next for Lenny and Great Thing Cap? So we are actually in the process of setting up our fund. Uh, so um, if you are looking to, uh, you know, if you have an amazing deal that you want to partner with us on, we anticipate at some point that we'll be able to fully fund any deal that comes our way. Um, and, you know, we, we would like the deal flow to, to match what the investors are looking to do. And it's not just multifamily, just to be clear. We are open to other asset classes. Um, we are open to self-storage. We are open to uh, mobile home parks and uh, RV uh, car washes, commercial, mixed use, student housing, the, you know, assisted living. There are so many different options. We want to be able to diversify our portfolio for our investors. And it's much easier to do. This business is definitely going to be easier for us if we're able to provide those returns to our investors through a fund. Um, and it just makes deals a lot more easy. So we've actually taken a pause from doing specific deals. Um, the only one that we're kind of active with is Mark Tran. He's on this one. We, we are doing um, one with him, but in general, we're basically letting our investors know we're setting up a fund that if they're interested in investing with impact and giving back to communities, that this would be a great option for them. So that's next. And how come people, um, re where can they reach you at? Uh, so Lenny Bendo on any platform, uh, it's the same. There's only one Lenny Bendo. Uh, <laughs> The, technically, there's only one Chad Brinkerhoff with a with, but also there's uh, the uh, Great Dane Capital, which we were able to uh, uh, snag every single platform of social media: LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. In our website, GreatDaneCapital.com, uh, and if you want to reach out to either of us via email it's my name at greatdanecapital.com or chad's name chad at greatdanecapital.com so that's how you reach us this is awesome lenny thank you so much for you know investing the time here with us with everyone here sharing your journey your successes as well as sharing a lot of personal information um you know about you and, and chad um you know Really sad when when I heard of the news, and I I applaud you and and Chad's journey and to continue pushing forward and and just giving back just in general. Um, yeah. But with that being said, everyone, thank you so much for for jumping on, and I will pause the recording.